This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. You've heard of Facebook, right? Huge site, over 2 billion people visiting it every day. But what's it like actually working there? I talked with UX researcher Becca Hare to find out. I would say the people. It's just really fascinating and very humbling to work with people who come from so many diverse backgrounds and perspectives. It is just constantly challenging my assumptions. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, let's talk about our sponsors, Glitch, Google Design, and MailChimp. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. So whether you're into coding, design, music, or art, Glitch is the right tool for you. You can start from scratch or remix any of the available projects and make them your own. And if you get stuck on something, just raise your hand and get help from the Glitch community. Get started on making something awesome today at Glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. Again, that's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Did you know that the number one email marketing priority is personalization? It makes sense if you think about it. You only want to hear from the people and businesses that you like, and MailChimp helps make that happen with their robust campaign builder and a host of helpful automations. It's email marketing with a personal touch. Sign up at MailChimp.com today for a free account. MailChimp. Send better email. Now for this week's interview. We're talking to Forrest Young, head of design at Wolf Olin's in San Francisco. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Hi there, Maurice. So I am Forrest Young. I am the global principal of Wolf Olin's and part of uh, an extraordinary leadership team that spans San Francisco, New York City and London, where I work with other global principals and our leadership team in my particular focus on the role that design can have in um, working with ambitious leaders to help um, envision a better future. Now, for people who might not be familiar with Wolf Olin's, can you talk, I guess, a little bit about the company and some of the things that you've done? Absolutely. So I think, you know, Wolf Olin's is one of the maybe rare companies that can lay claim to maybe putting, you know, the term branding, you know, on the map. I literally haven't written the book, you know, on branding from Wally, Wally Olin's. And I think Wolf Olin's unique place in, in history as it comes to design is that they kind of reclaimed visual identity and brand from a purely advertising focus meaning that brands and experiences people have with brands isn't something just purely relegated to broadcasting and kind of messaging to people, but it should be something ultimately that helps b- build a bridge and democratize these companies so that these companies become more user-friendly, more accessible. Wolf Owens was definitely a child of the 60s, you know, founded by you know, children of the 60s, and I think it has that that 60s optimism, you know, when the first clients were, were the Beatles, where Wolf Olin's actually helped create Apple Records. And I think, you know, every decade, the company has tried to help push or you know, define a, a new category and to try to take chances and risks that are, I think, indicative of their role and, and being the, the kind of the people that, that started it and then therefore should, should, should be tasked with leading and, uh, and furthering the discussion. Now, last year, I know Wolf Olin's was honored as one of Fast Company's 2017 Innovation by Design Award winners. Uh, You all created something that was called Dot Dot. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. And it was a fantastic brief. It was working with the Zigbee Alliance, which is a large uh, international consortium of about 400 different companies. And these companies range from, you know, from Philips to Samsung. And ultimately, these companies are tasked with aligning 
intelligence and opportunity in kind of building an, an Internet of Things that's open and accessible. And so the Zigbee Alliance was really responsible for creating the mesh network or the protocol for the Zigbee protocol, which essentially was, you know, 802.14. And why that's relevant is that, you know, at the time, there were only really two forms of mainstream connectivity, be they, you know, Wi-Fi, which is kind of, you know, um, kind of a spoken hub type of centralized network, and Bluetooth, which was using kind of master and slave pairing. And mesh networking was incredibly valuable and creating connectivity that didn't require the amount of energy consumption that had huge impacts on the fields of large-scale agribusness, um, as well as you know city and kind of urban lighting and HVAC infrastructure. Our particular brief was how do you create a new brand for a language that hopefully would unite devices. So essentially would be living on top of a hardware and software layer that would allow you know, everything to speak together. So whether it was a, a light bulb that can speak to, to a radio, that can speak to a thermostat. And ultimately, what we were tasked with is creating a brand that was in some ways advocating for an open Internet of Things versus a closed Internet of Things. As many companies were trying to, you know, create walled gardens or, you know, very particular device to device protocols that were for one brand only. And so I think part of what we tasked ourselves with was how could we actually design a brand for an open Internet of Things using open source or an open source approach. And I think that's where we asked ourselves the question, if this is supposed to be a universal language that connects you know, devices over radio, what other inspiration can we have for universal language? We looked at everything from Esperanto to Morse code, right, the original you know, universal language. And this idea of dots and dashes emerged as a universal lexicon, one that everyone could understand. And I think the challenge today is that a lot of brands are global, but they're not universal. You know, they may have, you know, started, originated in one particular region, and they're still optimized in terms of the visual language or even the tone of voice for a particular region. I think for dot dot, we wanted to make sure that this mark or this emblem was just as um, emotive and poignant, you know, in China as it was in San Francisco. And so starting with, you know, kind of Morse code, we asked ourselves if we could explain the open Internet of Things to a five-year-old and give a five-year-old a crayon and say, you draw one line for hardware, another line on top of that that's, you know, software, and then two dots over those two lines that are the first two devices connecting over radio. And if it happens to look like a face, then it's probably going to be easier to remember. And that was kind of a starting point. And working with this consortium of engineers and thinkers, we were able to come up with a logo that could be texted, a logo that could be sent through SMS. The idea that anybody could actually create the logo and the logo wouldn't live in a brand portal, but actually live in a code repository. So actually the logo is housed in, in GitHub. We also work with the kind folks at Google Fonts to come up with a typeface or an approach to typography that was utilizing open font licensing, which means that you, know, you download a, um, a typeface for free via Google Fonts, and then any modification, similar to kind of a kind of Creative Commons license, you upload back into this repository of kind of ongoing kind of typographic growth and, and, uh, and kind of a library, if you will. And so I think why it was successful was that, and why it was hard, is we gave ourselves the challenge of trying to design in the same language as the, the aim or the goal strategically that the, uh, the alliance is going after. I really like that you all even thought about how it would be depicted typographically. You know, I mean, I think sometimes when people think about brands, they'll think, oh, well, we'll just like get a font from here. or We'll have a, a custom font or something made. But I like the thought and the intent that went into creating, uh, you know, kind of a typographic word mark that also accurately and adequately represents kind of what the technology does. I think that is that is really hard to do. It's interesting, you know, it's 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 trying to find the right solution, you know, for the problem. And I think a lot of times, you know, as designers, we get, you know, swayed by something we've seen or something that we've we've heard about, we're successful, you know, be it a bespoke typeface. And I think there are, there is a time and a place for bespoke typefaces or you know something that's off the shelf that might be a very particular regional nuance that you want to pick up. But ultimately for this particular problem and being that it was a consortium of so many different types of companies, open source typography was really a good push and nudge to a lot of these companies that, you know, might have been hedging their bets on whether they wanted to build a walled garden or whether they wanted to truly create interoperable solutions. Where is dot dot now? Is it still being developed? Is it now currently in the market? Where is it? 
Uh, so Dot Dot has, has been successfully, I think, extended to a lot of the, the member organizations. And part of the launch was actually introducing Dot Dot at CES. And so we created this introductory anthem film. But part of the challenge was that we knew a lot of the people that are going to be visiting the booth at CES, you know, weren't going to have you know, English as a first language. And so the language of Dot Dot very much exists as a series of pictograms, as much as it does, you know, kind of a Latin based character language. And I think similar to silent film, we wanted to make sure that, you know, the identity system wasn't based on Latin based, you know, Western English, but ultimately it was something that could have a pictographic shorthand. So if you did see the dot dot emblem, you might see a face. If you saw those two dots added to things, they were a sense that things were coming alive, that things were been given eyes so they could actually see and hear other devices. And so I think part of it was the introduction to the language to 802.14, that this was a language that was being you know developed by the Zigbee Alliance for a lot of these applications. And I think right now they're actually pushing into four key audiences that we outlined. One, uh, manufacturers. You know, so how can this signature of dot dot give people you know reassurance, but ultimately how can it be you know routed or form injected molded? And so that was part of the challenge was making sure that the symbol itself wasn't too complicated or ornate for a manufacturer to etch into a you know microchip. The second one were developers, how to get developers excited about writing code against this particular language. The third were retailers, so making sure that people are navigating and trying to find this you know, signature of well, what is this open Internet of Things tick that helps me understand that this is something that will work with all my devices. And then lastly, an ongoing push in terms of making sure that people understand, similar to net neutrality, that they have a choice about you know, what the Internet of Things can be. It can be open Internet of Things in which people are developing for many different types of devices to be able to communicate with one another, or there can be the one device to rule them all and the closed or the walled garden ecosystem. And I think it's important that even as part of the design language that the companies and the consumers are, are made aware, you know, that there is a choice and that there's an open Internet of Things and a closed Internet of Things and ultimately that this is advocating for, for openness. I really like that idea, especially of having your devices be able to kind of talk to each other, especially across across like different brands. Like recently I've been getting into home automation, so I've got like smart bulbs. I've got a Google Home Mini uh, mounted on the wall of my kitchen. I've got a Google Home on my desk and all this stuff. And they all can kind of natively sort of talk to each other. But like, what if I brought in, actually, no, this is actually a really good, uh, a good example. I have also like a light switch in the kitchen. It's this thing called a switch mate. You just put it over your regular light switch. That will talk to none of them. So I have to like kind of manually still use it, even though it's supposed to be this automatic thing. Like I can only connect with it through Bluetooth. It won't connect to Google Home or something like that. And I'm thinking dot dot would be able to at least have these things really sort of talk to each other in a universal Internet of Things kind of way. That's a great use case, Maurice. And I think, you know, more and more so it's you have to create a sense of demand from, you know, mass market to demand that things are interoperable. I think it's enough people being made aware or even having frustrated experiences like SwitchMate, for instance, to say, wouldn't it be so amazing for users that all their devices can speak to each other? They would be safer. They would probably save money. They'd probably spend less on dongles or things that have to translate from device to device. And ultimately, I think it's when mass market is made aware that that is a choice and decision and they'll start to demand and and ask that of everything from you know a kickstarter campaign to something that it's uh, being pushed at by an established company and i think the safety part is definitely important uh, we've seen all kinds of news articles about how these internet of things enabled devices really don't have that great of a security someone who can access your wi-fi network could be able to still access you know, your light bulbs or, you know, whatever other kind of IoT enabled devices you have in your home. I'm guessing that with dot dot that there is some higher level of security enabled since everything's kind of able to talk to each other. They're not using like different code bases or protocols or anything like that. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, having invented the mesh network, I think the Zigbee Alliance is really positioned to be at the forefront of what are those necessary security protocols and what are those safety checks that 
that the member consortium can do across all the different, uh, you know, kind of company products. And it's incredibly important because I think initially and early on in kind of open IoT, there were instances of malware that were being like, points of entry if they came in through through various devices. And what's exciting also is to see how technology itself is both evolving, but taking into consideration things like safety and privacy for, for networks. So Philips, of course, plays a huge role in the Zigbee Alliance. And, uh, and I think a lot of times uh, is probably responsible for ushering in people's first experience to home automation or IoT, because I think our smart light bulb is one of the most kind of awe-inspiring things to, to be able to control the color or something from your phone and things mm-hmm. like that, to be able to sync with music. But I think what I am most excited about is a new technology that is probably going to be coming to mass market in you know a couple of years uh, called LiFi. And LiFi is a light fidelity network that utilizes light waves instead of radio waves to create essentially secure, hyper connected and hyper fast uh, types of connectivity. So light can't pass through walls. And so your LiFi networks are essentially secure as long as you are you know kind of constrained to that particular room. And so what's exciting to me is for Dot Dot and for the Zigbee Alliance, we really use light as a metaphor, saying light is a point of entry and illumination is the role of this particular alliance. But for a lot of people, it starts with lighting, then it goes to climate control or thermostat, and then it goes to other types of automation. And so for us, you know, light was definitely the first base, if you will, establishing kind of a relationship with IoT. And so it's exciting to think of light itself as a form of connectivity, which I think we're going to be seeing in the next couple of years. Wow. <laughs> Li-Fi, that is, that's wild. I've not heard of that. You hit me on to something. I had not heard of that yet. No, it's incredibly exciting. And I think, you know, it's, it's in a similar way that, you know, when um, Edison came out with the light bulb and he started to think of, you know, street lighting and how, you know, street lights transformed walkability and how many pedestrians were crossing and who was walking at night now that streets were lit and were they safer for teens and children. I think we're going to see a similar thing with, if you have a street light that is also a connectivity hub, that becomes an incredibly democratic way for people to access, you know, secure networks within that particularly hyperlocal region. And so people may have a new relationship with the with the street lamp or the traffic light if these are connected hubs as well as being just light signals. When I guess when you're thinking about designing those sorts of things, are there any ethical concerns that kind of come into mind? Like I'm thinking just recently at Google I.O., they uh, released this new thing that they're doing called Google Duplex, which is this AI-powered voice automation that can, like, call businesses through Google Assistant and pretend to talk like a human. We're seeing how technology can spoof people, of course, in photos because of Photoshop, but, like, also videos with deep fakes. And even, like, I'm thinking about something like this with Li-Fi, where, yes, it's, like, light waves passing information. I don't know where there could be possible ethical concerns, but are those the sorts of things that you, well, I wouldn't say are those sorts of things. Do you think about those sorts of things when it comes to kind of working with this sort of technology? Absolutely. And I think, you know, having you know been born out of that 60s optimism and maybe a little bit of 60s skepticism of kind of institutions and, and kind of nefarious forces is a sense of really making sure that the leaders that we choose to partner with do have that moral compass and we're on the road to installing a moral compass. And that becomes part of, you know, not just taking on a design gig, but ultimately saying, one, we won't shy away from a formidable problem or circumstances, but we have to be reassured that the leadership team is committed to doing the right thing. And I think do the right thing has definitely become, you know, like a, like a mantra in terms of those things. So we are asking those difficult questions and pressing them on well for whom and who benefits and who can access this. And, and, you know, I think when anything like voice is concerned, you know, I think most people don't realize that a lot of what Sandy Pentland's research MIT has proven through sociometric solutions and from this device that he created called the sociometer is that through prosody, which essentially is just your vocalization range, it's just the waveform of how you speak. So much information is communicated through your prosody or waveform. Yeah. So for instance, you can ascertain, you know, who's dominant, who's going to be submissive, and ultimately what is the interrelationship between kind of peer to peer. And you can establish and create algorithms of 
essentially influence networks with nothing more than just vocalization range. You don't even need to know the content or the words that are being spoken. So I think those things will both be a benefit in terms of devices being able to understand things like your emotional state or your physical state. But there can also be, you know, the other side, which is, you know, unchecked. Things like speech or voice recognition is an incredible amount of data that's being captured and how is that data being used. And so I think it's going to be imperative that everyone is just reading up and asking those difficult questions. And for people like us to be pressing the leadership teams as well as the product teams to be always aware of the kind of moral and ethical implications of what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to venture too far into like Black Mirror territory with what we're talking about here. Uh, so I do kind of want to bring it back to learn more about you and about your design journey. Tell me, where did you grow up? So I've lived in uh, 12 cities. And so I think I can claim most of the United States with the exception of Hawaii, Alaska, and the Pacific Northwest. So I was, okay. born, in, I was born in San Diego, California, Pacific Beach to be specific. And I spent two years there and then switched coasts. I went from the West Coast to East Coast, where I spent incredibly, I think, informative period of time being a child in Cambridge uh, around the late 70s and early 80s. And I think why it was hugely instrumental is that my, my mother was doing graduate studies at Harvard. But more importantly, she was also employed at Atari. And it was mm. the kind of the heyday of the Atari Cambridge Research Laboratory, where Alan, you know, Alan Kay had come over from Xerox Park. You had Seymour Papert doing incredibly inspired research around kind of constructionist learning and the development of the languages Logo and Basic. And so my mother was researching educational outcomes and, you know, self-directed learning trajectories. And essentially the future of ed tech, it was the ed tech hadn't been coined as a term. And so I would do everything from pretend to be sick so I could go to go to work with my mother and be exposed <laughs> to, you know, arcades that were, of course, free and robots and laser discs and all types of beta technologies. But I think it was I think if I look back on that experience, it was being around incredibly bright, genius level people who were having fun, who were laughing. And I think the influence of Seymour Papert on both my mom's work and on me is that there's a lot of value in making something that you can learn a lot through the act of making and that play has an incredible function and that incredibly intelligent people don't have to be, you know, dry and adversarial, but you can be jovial and playful. And those are also equally valid forms of expressing your understanding of something. And then I think I jumped to Albany, uh, to East Lansing, to Chicago, to New Haven, to Orlando, to Austin, to New York City, and then now back in San Francisco. So I'm now kind of full circle back in the state of California. Nice. So you kind of mentioned as a kid being able to, you know, sort of shadow your mom and see all these sorts of things. So it sounds like creativity was a pretty big part of your childhood. You know, it was. And it, what's so interesting is that um, I have a huge number of artists and kind of designers within within our family, which I think is, is pretty unusual. I think specifically, you know, a lot of times I think sons and daughters of immigrants or even I think in African-American families, the idea of, you know, being an artist is seen to be kind of anti-vocational and you're being pushed into, you know, those professions of doctor, lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think my family was very, very much open to and I think expected everyone to have a relationship with their creative side, which was helpful for me to know that that was both familiar and, uh, and something I, I shared with other people in the family. One of the plot twists that probably about three years ago, my mother and I realized is that my grandfather was probably my greatest artistic influence. And uh, why I say that is that I only knew that knew him as a retired fire chief and that he had helped to integrate the San Diego fire department, that he was a world war II veteran, a lot of great stories about, you know, him as a person. But when he passed, we went through his garage and we found a bunch of slide carousels that actually demonstrated that he was a fine art photographer, that he was going out shooting on a Leica, you know, rangefinder, you know, documenting Route 66 and you know, Carlsbad Caverns and was actually shooting on site after they would put out a fire. And so it's an incredible body of work as a fine art photographer that was completely unknown to me until after he passed. But then I realized all of this subtle nudging that he had done along the way, whether it was, hey, take a look at this camera, and hey, look at this composition. Little did I know that he was giving me these kind of artistic nudges. So I would say he was probably my greatest artistic influence that I only discovered posthumously. But now I think it's kind of a reexamining of all these interactions that I had with various family members and seeing that it was kind of inevitable that I would do what I would do. Yeah. 
So when it was time for you to go to college, I would imagine since you had your family's kind of support in terms of pursuing that creative side, you decided to go to Cornell University. Tell me what your time was like there. Cornell was very interesting because I think I, I my, my first choice was actually University of Chicago. And I did get into University of Chicago and was actually prepared to play football for the Maroons, who were, uh, I guess, you know, ages ago, they were like the best team. And uh, Jay Berwanger was a Heisman Trophy winner. And so I was interested in, in going to a very rigorous academic school as well as, um, you know, still trying to do uh, sports as well. When I went to Cornell's campus, I just fell in love with it. And it was all the things that I think I wanted out of a campus experience. It felt very kind of transcendentalist. It felt like there was a lot of time that I was going to be spending, you know, walking by the, the river, the gorges, over the bridges. And it felt very meditative, which I think was perfect for me. I don't think it's the right school for everyone. I think it is very much in an enclave of upstate New York. But I think I had so much experience both with an amazing AP art instructor in high school and having done kind of college life drawing, you know, throughout that when I got to Cornell, I wanted to try something different. I wanted to try to flex a different muscle. And, you know, when I look back on it, you know, how art education is taught in high schools where you have the art kids are kind of the kids who are who are the, the, the less driven kids. And you have the, you know, student government kids who are like the overachievers and you have the AP kids who are on their way to kind of, you know, certain schools. And I think I was like a, a person who navigated all those different entities. And so for me, college was the, the college decision was incredibly confusing because I didn't want to choose in high school. I didn't feel like I should have to choose in, uh, in college. But I ended up initially pursuing hotel and Cornell had a prestigious hospitality program. And I thought, well, I know fine art, so maybe this is time to kind of understand you know, the realm of hospitality and business. And I think I did that for, you know, a year and a half. And then I realized, uh, I don't think this is for me. I think I need to go back and be around other type of creative thinkers. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up doing somewhat of a hybrid, a dual degree between kind of psychology, or as they call it, kind of human development and, and fine arts. And so my experience of Cornell was one of being reminded that, you know, I can't escape a kind of creative trajectory, but that I think it was a creative trajectory that was, that was being inspired by the human condition. And I think why psychology was important is understanding how people think and what are people's motivations, as well as the, the form and the, the beauty of something, something you could take. And now after Cornell, you went out, you started working for a few agencies. That was kind of your early career. What was that like? You know, after Cornell, and I think this was kind of the dawn of the, the Internet, I was trying to desperately learn web design, desperately pick up a bunch of now archaic uh, technologies like Macromedia Director and things like that, <laughs> and, uh, and trying to you know understand what how Hillman Curtis was doing all the things that he was doing in Flash. And it was a very interesting time because the web had gone from that kind of 1.0, very kind of you know sterile type of Craigslist looking interfaces to uh, more dynamic, time based experiences that were happening, and it was just incredibly exciting. And I'm going to the web was starting to feel very cinematic, and I was trying to learn all of the tools that allowed one to create these you know cinematic depictions. But I think it was during this phase where I realized, you know, I don't want to be a you know web designer, developer, or kind of front end developer. What I do want to do is, you know, something that feels much more visceral. And so <laughs> during this phase of time, while I was taking out a bunch of projects, identity projects and web design projects, I actually started studying theater. And I got really, really serious about theater. And this is always something that I never thought that I would do. And certainly in high school, when I was, you know, doing four sports and a bunch of things, there wasn't any time to do theater in high school. And so I started studying theater with incredible enthusiasm and rigor. And then got to a point where I said, you know what, maybe I should just do this and I should try to go to graduate school for theater. And so, um, you know, the most unprofessional thing I could do was to Google. I literally went up to Google and I said, Google, what's the best acting program? <laughs> and Google <laughs> says, oh, Juilliard. And I said, Google, what is the best graphic design program? And it spits out Yale. And so I said, oh, my gosh, that's where the African-American cultural hero teaches. And so you can imagine two Google search results and one misconception about Paul Rand as an African-American cultural hero led to me finding myself at a Yale interview weeks down the, down the path from a Juilliard audition. And so it was incredibly you know, lucky and fortuitous moment that I could be auditioning for Juilliard and interviewing at Yale for MFA. But that happened. And I realized that 
putting myself at this fork in the road would force a decision just out of pure exhaustion. And so ultimately, you know, I decided to uh, pursue an MFA in design at Yale and realized during my interview that Paul Rand was not an African American, but that would become the ongoing, you know, interview joke of all time. But that uh, <laughs> now was my responsibility, if I, you know, to actually be the African American president uh, at Yale. And so, and actually, it's kind of funny that I now. I'm on faculty at Yale, and I kind of look back on that and think of, wow, I would never have been able to imagine that when I was in- in- interviewing as an embarrassed candidate. So, yeah, thinking that Paul Rand was African-American is what sort of wanted you to go there. That sort of was the compelling reason. And then all of a sudden finding out, oh, wait, no, he's not. And that had to be kind of embarrassing, I guess. It was it was an absolute shock because you know, <laughs> that whole misconception came from, you know, working in a fine art library in undergrad and taking a dust jacket from the, the Stephen Heller monograph that everyone has in their bookshelf. And to me, that black and white side profile uh, picture of Paul Rand looking out reminded me of all of these civil rights images, you know, from Eyes in the Prize that you know, my parents had me watch, you know, endless reels of from Rosa Parks to Stokely Carmichael to, you know, SNCC and the Freedom Riders. And so when I saw that image of Paul Rand, I thought, oh, my goodness, it's just, it's just another cultural, you know, just another cultural hero from the 60s trying to uh, to level the playing field. And so I always just situated him within a civil rights context and as an African-American cultural hero. So when it came time to, to choose uh, between Juilliard and Yale, it was, oh, I want to go to the place where uh, where this uh, African-American cultural hero was, was, was able to affect cultural and corporate identity, be it, you know, IBM and UPS. And then during my interview, I think it was Scott Stoll from Open who said, oh, did you think that Paul Rand was black? And then he absolutely <laughs> lost it. And it's this ongoing thing every time I see Scott Stoll and we always talk about the Paul Rand moment. We share Paul Rand stories. <laughs> So how did, I guess, Yale end up preparing you once you got back out there in the agency world? I know kind of going for an MFA is a pretty arduous task. How did it help you once you got back out there? Well, I think what was very helpful to me was that the faculty that came through Yale when I was there and the students that I was lucky enough to uh, be in graduate school with at the time was just an amazing group of people and, and very different. You know, so there was everyone from you know, the amazing book designer, Jeff Hahn, who was a classmate to Dylan Fracaretta and who would then partner with Jeff to launch Pinup. You know, Yoon Jae Choi would go on to, you know, to two by four fame and ultimately to, um, to start her own practice with Ken Meyer, who was also in the program. There were just so many people who were very passionate about doing something different and unique at the same time being supported by a lot of faculty that I really responded to. So from Linda Van Dersen and Armand Mavis to Carl Martins and Irma Boom, and a lot of a lot of Dutch faculty, to be quite honest, but I think there was something international and global that they brought to my understanding of what graphic design could be that helped me not be overly focused on American design history and legacy, but to be able to be thinking broader and more expansively. I do think that Yale's focus is much more on finding one's own way to design as much as it is the content that one should be drawn to or have affinity towards. And so I think that that gave me the confidence and the toolkit to set off on a design trajectory that was non-traditional, that was going to be zigging and zagging through a bunch of different types of places. So you're a critic in graphic design now at Yale, at the Yale School of Art. What does that entail? Like, What sorts of things are, are you doing in that role? My role is, is unique, and, and I love that Sheila DeBretful is the chair of the program, has allowed myself to occupy a role called the four-time critic. And a four-time critic, my role is defined as having four meaningful interactions during the year. And usually those take the form of end-of-semester crits, both for the second-year students in their first semester, as well as the, the kind of the graduation or thesis crits. And then leading a storytelling workshop with the time Kira Alexandra and Manuel Miranda. And what we do is... A lot of times that, you know, graduate students are so heads down in developing their thesis, which is a book. It's the book articulation of their thoughts um, and approach to design. And what we do is try to help them understand how they can tell this story orally or performative. And so the storytelling workshop is ultimately, you know, imagining their whole body work in a series of 20 or 17 images and given a, a limited time constraint. How would they articulate their thesis to their peers and to the larger 
school of our audience. And I think it's sometimes it's um, it always feels like it comes at the wrong time because everyone's like, oh, I just need more time to finish my book. But then I think afterwards we hear from a lot of the students that it was incredibly helpful, especially since they you know, entered into the, the world of work that being able to articulate their thesis in a much more succinct and crisp way was actually of, of added value. So my role is really focusing on giving them a good kind of critical sounding board for their work, but then also helping them find the narrative encapsulation of their body of work as well. I think that kind of role is really important, not just at, you know, kind of formal design programs like at at an Ivy League, you know, school like Yale, but I would think particularly at like HBCUs that have smaller design programs, someone to be able to give that sort of guidance, I think would be super helpful. Absolutely. And what was so interesting about just the recent you know, AIG gala, and I'll give you another congratulations for the Stephen Heller Prize, but <laughs> what was so fascinating about having you speak about Aaron Douglas was about working along a time continuum that extends both into the future and the past. And I think when it comes to HBCUs and specifically to Fisk, which was, you know, what I was speaking about, it's almost unfathomable to imagine 1888 W.B. Du Bois graduates from Fisk and to imagine that this just intellectual powerhouse is graduating from an HBCU. And then Fisk, they would go on to have one of the true giants of visual culture in Aaron Douglas who is trying to create this vision of an integrated society in the segregated South at the time, and then being able to partner with the Stiglitzes and the O'Keeffe's in terms of you know building out that Van Vechten gallery. And I think what's interesting now is seeing how the fact that Du Bois wanted to go to Harvard, but he couldn't afford to go to Harvard, even though all of his family and friends chipped in in Great Barrington, he could only afford to go to Fisk. And so it's it's interesting to imagine what if Du Bois wasn't able to actually attend you know, an institution of higher learning? What a tragedy that would have been. And so I think a lot of what the conversation should be shifting to is also one about class and one of access. I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, pedigree and pedagogy and whether it's Ivy League or whether it's, you know, one of the kind of classic art schools, but more and more so who has access to the conversation and who can mm-hmm. understand the conversation and control the conversation from a very unique perspective. And I think we need more voices. We need more, um, more representations, not just from race and not just from gender, but one of the things that I'm really passionate about is even a bias towards able-bodied people. You know, so people that can't necessarily see and hear and walk. And I think this is truly, I think, the, the biggest promise for technology is being the great equalizer, not only in terms of access and race and gender, but things like class and things like able, able-bodied able um, bias. And so that becomes incredibly exciting, both from how one thinks about an institution for higher learning and the role of HBCUs and classic art schools. But I do think that it's incredibly exciting to think of an institution like Fisk with someone like Aaron Douglas, who is both, one, telling students that they don't have to inherit a history that they can't negotiate. And I think that the past is oftentimes seen as something that is non-negotiable. And I think was incredibly illuminating to me when, you know, I was first made aware of Aaron Douglas, probably, you know, as a child or something, that this person was giving form to things that had already taken place and in some ways created a different prism for imagining the historical past, whether it was the classical builder or relationship to pharaohs of, of ancient Egypt, as well as a projection of what we can build together as a society. And, of course, he was inspired by Alain Locke, the great philosopher and coiner of the term usable past, Mm -hmm. that ultimately designers should be navigating both the past and understanding that the past has also been authored, usually by the victors or by, you know, very particular authors and very particular perspectives, as well as being able to envision a future and designing for a future that isn't necessarily one dimensional. And so this is where I think that, you know, HBCUs need to play a huge role in defining that and bringing that voice to the table that otherwise is going to be one dimensional. Amen to that. Amen to all of that. And I guess it's sort of a good segue into the work, uh, the teaching work that you're doing now at CCA. You're talking about future design with students. Can you go a little bit into that? Absolutely. Well, I was, uh, here in San Francisco and was was a recent transplant from New York City and John Sueda had reached out one to help work with him and his team of faculty to help organize the kind of the graduate exhibition. 
And I became made aware of a, of a great group of individuals at CCA that were helping to, to, I think, straddle a lot of the conversations that are happening out here, specifically around Silicon Valley, around not necessarily funneling kids into these tech enclaves without understanding how to think and specifically understanding design and context. And John asked me if I would be open to creating a curriculum around a kind of design and context course that was going to be focused on on future design. And specifically, I wanted to discuss with students, um, MFA students, that the future as a muse was something that was incredibly uh, multifaceted, you know, that from a Benjamin perspective, from his, you know, kind of angel of history, that oftentimes the future is not unlike walking backwards, right? We can't actually see the future because if we could, we'd probably all be millionaires or billionaires, but we're actually walking backwards, looking at the references and the footprints of where we've been and seeing the catastrophe of the past. And so that to me was an incredibly illuminating way to think about the history as well as, you know, Dun and Raby and in terms of, you know, speculative design and in creating future artifacts that get you to think about the present condition. And so I think, the future is a great muse to be able to understand bias as well as one's unique relationship towards a brief. And I always tell students in future design, who here is a futurist? And, you know, like two people will raise their hand. And I ask the question, who here is optimistic about the future? And maybe three people raise their hand out of class of 14. Mm -hmm. And then I say, you know, every design brief is a future assignment. Right. Your brief is essentially solving a problem that ultimately is to be bringing about an outcome that hasn't happened yet. You're just working on a smaller time horizon, but you could be working on a product roadmap that's five to 10 years. You could be working on something that's a 50 year plan. And so I think when they realize that, they go, oh, my goodness, I should be a futurist or I will be a futurist, whether I acknowledge it or not. (laughs) And then secondly, I probably should be optimistic because if I'm not, I should believe that my own skills as a designer should be able to bend the arc of a project towards one that either addresses a personal kind of moral compass or belief about what something should be. Do you have a like a dream project that you would love to work on? Like, I, I feel like with the work that you're doing um, at Wolf Olin, particularly, I know with Dot Dot, and I'm sure there are other projects that uh, you might not be able to mention just yet, but it really sounds like the work that you're doing is kind of at the bleeding edge or at the, the cutting edge of what's coming next. Do you have a dream project or anything you'd love to do that you maybe haven't had the time to do yet or don't have the resources or anything like that? I have two dream projects. One, I already reached out to Jonathan Key about. <laughs> because I just, uh, I just love just hearing him talk about typography. And of course, with Marcos Key, I'm just kind of enamored by just different voices that are starting to emerge and celebrate different ways we can think about everything that we think we know, like typography and color. I think my two dream projects would be working with Fisk on some level and specifically looking at the typography of Aaron Douglas and specifically that that's that little stubby legged R and other types of unique typographic notions and trying mm-hmm. to figure out some way in which I feel we can repay a favor back to Fisk for all the great gifts, whether it's, you know, Du Bois or Aaron Douglas. And so I think, I think Jonathan and I might have something up our sleeves for, for that. And this case, the second one is what I mentioned earlier. I, I can't think of a more exciting thing than Li-Fi, um, you know, li- a light fidelity network. And so putting it out there, signify people <laughs> and Li-Fi people. But yeah, those are probably my two dream projects. And so hopefully one's underway and the second one, maybe they'll, they'll hear this revision path project and they'll they'll say oh wow we heard that on revision path do you have any advice that you've gotten over the years that has really stuck with you yeah so it's the first great piece of advice that i had and this is when i was graduating was from uh, shield of redful and she said that the quote-unquote dream project and so i think it's perfect that you mentioned that your dream projects are usually never in the wrapper or the package you expect them to be And I think that, of course, I would have to learn this the hard way. I think a lot of times, you know, designers will see a certain brand and assume, oh, I'm designing for this brand. Therefore, it must be a dream project because I have respect and love for this brand. But oftentimes those can be horrendous projects because they understand the magnetism that everyone has to their brands. And so they can essentially maybe treat their partners or kind of creative consultants in a certain way. 
oftentimes, like Zigbee Alliance, it was an incredible partnership, but not one that I would have expected to have worked out that well. And I think a lot of my favorite projects, you know, probably Dot Dot for Zigbee Alliance. And recently we launched a identity for Zymergen, which is a molecular technology in Emeryville are working with scientists and engineers and people that don't have any overlap with design. And there's a mutual respect about, I can't understand or operate at your level in your domain, but what I can do is operate the best level in our domain. And we find a happy medium. And I think some of the challenges I think we're seeing happening in creative consultancies is, you know, how do you marry well with in-house design teams who's leading, who gets the credit, ultimately, how much should, you know, a creative consultant be exposed to. And so I think these are some of the things I think all creative consultants are trying to negotiate is that role of, of kind of working from afar, or kind of a critical distance. But I think um, those are the things that come top of mind from a, a piece of advice. And I couldn't agree more with Sheila now, which is be open that a thing that could look like a terrible project or uninteresting project might actually be the dream project. And the thing that might be the dream project is, is not. And the second one, which is advice I give to myself and I give to all graduating students is the taste or trust rule. So I always tell people, if your client partner does not have taste, at least the taste as you would define it to be a kind of a, a certain level of kind of aesthetic literacy, then they should trust you to be that expert and to help guide and navigate. Or if they have trust, that means that they truly are positioning you as the expert if they have neither taste or trust, that tends those tend to be the flags for the worst projects because they're not going to be able to be kind of, you know, trench mates in terms of being a co-collaborators. And they're not going to trust that your word is one coming from an expert and will have to show it to a bunch of people. So I give people the taste or trust rule. And usually that seems to uh, to, to be work to work out for people. So that's my advice. And the advice that I receive is, is of course, the dream projects don't come in the in dream packages. I like that taste or trust rule. I like that a lot. <laughs> what keeps you motivated and inspired with this work? You know, I think understanding, you know, my own history of how I got into design and it was through a, essentially a misreading of a photograph of a very famous person being someone that I had kind of a, an imagined relationship or a distorted relationship with is trying to remind myself of the necessity and the imperative of not only representation, but trying to advocate for people that oftentimes can't advocate for themselves. And this could be everything from people who aren't able-bodied people who can't see, hear, and walk, or people who are underrepresented, and to try to make these notions imperatives and not, you know, nice to haves. And I think the implications of bias being baked into technological products, you can have huge societal impacts on literally safety, car safety, plane safety, um, home safety. And so I think that in making these issues an imperative, I think there's no shortage of, of motivation. What do you say to people who think that that design is simple? Like, for example, before I you know started the work that I'm doing now, I had my own studio and I would talk to clients and present to clients and things like that. And clients would either be one of, they would fall into one of two camps. The first camp is they're like, oh, I'm not a designer. And then that's not to necessarily say that they trusted me. But whenever I would ask them about very simple things like concepts or colors, they just kind of completely put it out of their head. And then there's the second camp that thinks that what you do is just play all day. And that is just very simple. Like, oh, anybody can do that. I can do that. Which, of course, I often then invite them to do and they never do. But what do you do when people like will look at work that you've done? Say, for example, dot dot. I mean, dot dot is two dots, two lines. What if someone looks at that and they're like, "Oh, I can do that. That's simple." What do you What do you say to those kind of people? Well, I think it's interesting. We're, we're at a very, very interesting point in time whereby I would say it's the hard, it's the hardest environment to be working as a designer, and it's also the best environment to be working as a designer. And why Why is that? Well, one. We've never had a society that's been more literate about design and not hyper literate, but at least, you know, anyone on the street could probably name, you know, their top five favorite typefaces. Now they would probably call them fonts and they would probably, you know, <laughs> say, say some of the usual suspects, but 
at least they would have an, a basic understanding of font software and how to type things out and that the typefaces have a different flavor or feel. They wouldn't probably know that, you know, the difference between a sans serif and a serif or like whatever, to be able to say ascenders and descenders or X heights or cap heights, but they would have a basic understanding of typography, which is incredibly new. And I think there's a, so many tools that you know, people are using to be able to generate, you know, UGC content. So whether that is, you know, um, Instagram video or stories uh, to basically people doing film editing on their devices. And so people are actually experiencing the creative process on the daily that are completely kind of lay people or mass market. And so that's both the blessing and the curse of everybody having a basic understanding or familiarity of the tools of design. That being said, I think to truly come up with new approaches to design requires to almost throw out any assumption one has had about design in the hopes of creating something new. And so I think the dot dot example is is incredibly right on, Maurice, because yes, everyone can type it, but maybe there is beauty in having it be hyper accessible. Because I think the old approach to design was incredibly elite, incredibly inaccessible, esoteric, you know, typefaces that were in some foundry that only a few designers had heard about that was were incredibly expensive and rare. It was all about exclusivity. It was all about being hyper unique. And I think um, with the emergence of things like, you know, system adaptive typography and whether you're on, you know, an Android device or an iOS device or Windows device, it actually just feels more intuitive. And I think that we have to almost reframe what the word beauty means in the way that mathematicians use the term elegance or beauty in reference to a proof. How can designers start to think of beauty through, you know, how something works and is something an elegant solution? I think that form in the classical sense will still continue to play a role, but form from both an experiential shape of a project is also going to come to the fore. And I think it's not going to be about necessarily making something net new. It might be something, you know, similar to hip hop that is both basically a new form of poetry that basically is able to remix and sample, but then to be able to contribute to something that is hyper specific and authentic. And I think more and more so that's what's required of, of designers. They're almost like the new forms of, of kind of cultural jockeys that are able to understand all these different threads and be able to stitch them together, but not necessarily creating something that the world hasn't seen before, which I think was like the old form of design, the ta-da, World's Fair. Now it's, oh, wow, this is a very interesting remix. And now that everyone has access to the internet, everyone has access to the larger history of visual culture, it's much harder to try to steal something and then show something as being original. Everyone says, oh, well, everyone can find the, the reference to that particular thing. So it's less about originality and more so about, is it right? And is it perfect for this application? I think that's something that I'm still learning as a designer is to kind of like to lose those old assumptions about what success looks like or feels like. Where do you sort of see yourself in the next five years? What kind of work do you want to be doing? You know, I think I've been incredibly lucky. I've been incredibly lucky to work at different parts of the creative process from upstream kind of strategy to, you know, visual identity and, you know, kind of future design, speculative artifacts, innovation, having had sense at, you know, places like Frog and understanding how to build like a design language system inspired by kind of a brand personality, but applied to, you know, a mobile, mobile interface or a set of components and pieces to even, you know, understand the implications of advertising and and media and how media propagates and kind of extends an idea or makes something viral that I think, you know, it's going to be about really trying to harness the power of technology for good. I think more and more with a lot of things that are coming out in the news about the importance of that moral compass and that type of ethical North Star to be able to guide that this technology is not all, all powerful and existing in a vacuum. It's very much the, the products of the people that imagine these futures and these things that should feel desirable. And so I think it's going to be probably looking at how technology can be applied towards making the world a better place and not just in a notional kind of, you know, company vision type of Anthem video, but really, you know, if it is, something like LiFi and LiFi and imagining what future forms of connectivity are going to be that allow, that allow for more people to access the internet or different ways in which, you know, representation can be addressed in various fields. I think it is probably something that is going to be closer to that moral compass and seeing the, the necessity of people who are willing to kind of hold that line. 
What advice would you give for people that are out here listening that they want to follow in your footsteps? They want to be a critic at a um, at an institution. They want to be the head of design somewhere. What kind of advice would you give to them for people that want to do that? Uh, so I would say you just be incredibly observant. So the first thing is to just develop amazing active listening you know, ability. So to be able to understand what someone is saying, what someone is actually meaning, which may be different than what they're actually saying, understanding how to read things like body language in a room, because I find that so many of the signals are not spoken. They are so subtle and being aware of how those signals are prevalent, both for people that are designers and colleagues in that field, but also people that are working in different areas of the business, whether they're more of a strategic function or an operational function. And I think being able to listen and to be able to be a sponge, it's almost like developing a, yourself into a hyper sponge. We're sponging not only the, the tactical you know, design information, but I think that the, the step of evolving in a design career is one of understanding how designers can translate their ideas to non-designers and then how to equip non-designers with the ability to advocate for those, those particular ideas. And I always tell people that there are, there are kind of three gates, right? The two gates are very apparent. The first gate is you need to be able to convince, usually through language, uh, orally or written, that an idea is good, right? That your internal team needs to be able to rally behind your idea for it to even be presented to a client partner. The second gate is the client partner who is the point of contact that, you know, the client team will have as their, you know, email person to route, you know, ideas and presentations. Then there is the third gate. And the third gate is the person that that person needs to present to you when you're not there. And the third gate is one that almost every designer that I work with tends to overlook because they, they can imagine the first two gates really clearly. I need to get my team inspired about an idea. Second one, I need to get the client excited about this idea. But the third one is, how do you get that client partner to get somebody else excited about that idea knowing that they will have to articulate your idea? And so essentially you're creating almost like a, like a viral signal that can be passed on from internal team to client partner to their kind of final gate. And I think one, understanding those signals I mentioned before, but then secondly, that those three gates are critical to your work being in the world. And I think it's only when your work is in the world and is being commented on, debated, attacked, praised, that you really understand, oh, was the work successful? Did it have an impact? Was it controversial? Was it helpful? Did it spur a new dialogue? Did it feel like it was contributing to the echo chamber? You only really get that sounding board when the work sees the light of day. But in order yeah. for it to see the light of day, it has to pass through those three gates. Well, Forrest, just to kind of wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? So the first thing is um, I have a website called ForrestYoung.com, which I have to update, but ForrestYoung.com was my attempt at trying to create <laughs> a set of links for all my favorite type foundries, my uh, individual design shops, the, the classical larger design shops, as well as keep tabs on you know, my colleagues in various kind of schools of higher learning. I have to update it, but I think ForrestYoung.com might actually be a good source for, for designers looking to get inspiration from you know, a global collection of people. So apologies if any links are broken. It's going to be updated soon. But I think that's probably one of the better indications of what I'm interested in. I also think that probably pretty soon um, there's going to be a lot of work that's going to be out in August uh, of this year from Will Bowens that I think will be, um, will be pretty easy to see. All right. Sounds good. Well, Forrest Young, thank you so much for coming on the show. There's so much that you talked about and covered. I really don't even know where to where to start. Usually when I wrap up these these interviews, I say, oh, well, we talked about this, this, and this. I mean, we talked about everything from mesh networks to critique at design schools and everything. It, it really is, is, I think, I think people can really tell that you're very passionate about design, not just where it's at, but where it can go into the future, of course, because you teach a course on future design. But I can tell that with the work that you're doing with Wolf Olins, that you're really trying to push, not just design for it, but just push like the culture and the language of design forward into, you know, kind of this new era. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing and thank you for coming on the show. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Maurice. Thank you for having me. Thoughts of love are in. 
And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Forrest Young and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Forrest and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, Glitch, Google Design, and MailChimp. Facebook designers work on creative products that are used by over 2 billion people. But what's it like actually working there? Everything Facebook designs is done at scale, so design critiques, metrics, and other factors are a huge part of how they work. Sound interesting? Then learn more about Facebook design and what they do at facebook.com forward slash design. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. From games to art to music and hardware, Glitch is flexible enough to create some really powerful tools. You can even use it for work or to learn how to code. The possibilities are endless. So what will you create today? Get started at glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. That's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. MailChimp is the world's largest marketing automation platform. They support millions of customers from small e-commerce shops to big online retailers, and they support the creative community as well. MailChimp really gives you the marketing tools to beat yourself on a bigger stage. Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music by Andre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, then please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute or two. It helps more people learn about the show, not just here in the U.S., but internationally as well. It helps the show in general by sort of bumping us up in the rankings for design podcasts. And I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, if you're listening to this and you want to hear next week's episode early, then you should become our patron over at Patreon. Now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives in our field are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support our mission, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. For just $5 a month, you can get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. 